I always loved the chief of a tribe in Latin America who said, Jane, we see our tribe as like an eagle. One wing is male, the other's female, and only when the wings are equal can our tribe fly high. Hello and welcome to the Tommy Love Show. That was Dr. Jane Goodall. She told me I could call her Jane, so that's what I will do. Last year, I had the extraordinary privilege to meet with Jane in Belgium. She was here for a conference, and her team gave me 20 minutes of her precious time. I used those minutes wisely, starting the interview by making chimpanzee sounds with her. Then, we turned back to English, and I asked her how children and adults can feel more connected with each other, with animals, and with our shared home. I was curious to hear about concrete solutions from her, why she still does what she does at the young age of 88, as well as how she fuels her passion and hope for the future of our planet. I was very impressed by Jane. She inspired me tremendously, and I still feel her loving energy months after meeting her. Being in her presence is a gift. For the few that do not know who Jane Goodall is, here are a few words about this inspiring lady. First, Dr. Jane Goodall is a living legend. I saw young girls cry when they saw her. Everyone wants to take a picture with Jane, and everything she says is either funny, inspiring, or both at the same time. Her life and work have inspired millions around the world to pursue their dreams and make a positive impact in our world. Dr. Goodall is a world-renowned ethologist and activist inspiring greater understanding and action on behalf of the natural world. In 1960, Jane was 26 years old when she started her research in the Gombe National Park in Tanzania. She was a trailblazer pursuing a career in a field that was very male-dominated at the time. This is wild. Imagine this. She's a woman in the 1960s pursuing a scientific career in Africa, living among chimpanzees. And her groundbreaking research on chimpanzees challenged the scientific community's understanding of animal intelligence and behavior and inspired a new era of wildlife conservation. Jane has dedicated her life to the study and protection of chimpanzees and other great apes. 60 years of studying the social and family interactions between them. Dr. Goodall is also the founder of the Jane Goodall Institute, which works to protect chimpanzees and their habitat. She also founded Roots and Shoots, which she will mention a couple times in the podcast. This is a youth-led program that empowers young people to make positive changes in their communities and for the environment. In April 2002, Dr. Goodall was named a UN Messenger of Peace. Her documentary called Jane illustrates beautifully her early exploration of Tanzania and her relationship with chimpanzees. Okay, now that you all know who Jane is, we can get started. I kick off the interview by giving her a stuffed monkey, a gibbon to be precise. I knew she loved these, a testament to her playful personality. Now please enjoy Dr. Jane Goodall. So I start with a gift. Mm -hmm. Right? This is for you. I know you mm. have many already. Mm. Um, beautiful. Yes. I don't know. He doesn't have a name yet. I have one as well. So you do. <laughs> what did I want to start with? Yesterday, you introduced us with the way chimpanzees say hello to each other. Yeah. Can you teach me a few words? Well, they're not really words. Their sounds, okay. you know. But the pantoot, the reason it's called a pantoot is because it's all in one breath. So you know how a dog goes, <laughs> so it's, <laughs> is that good? See, all in one. <laughs> no, <laughs> that's right, that's right, that's right. <laughs> wow. You so, don't need to make the, the sound, but... <laughs> See, it's all one breath. So it's a push of the breath, and then you... Yeah. <laughs> Is it? Yeah, it's sort of like that. <laughs> and these guys go... Oh, wait a minute, how do they go? Ooh, 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 
different. That's a gibbon. <laughs> and then chimps laugh. Okay. <laughs> That's chimp laughing. <laughs> and the babies cry when their mother won't let them suckle. <laughs> That's a baby chimp. It's Mother won't let it suckle. <laughs> <laughs> and oh, oh. What's that? That's it's... go away. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Jane. Um, I've known all the things you've done, and I've watched your documentaries, read your books, listened to your podcasts. But I was very moved to... I'm very moved to meet you. Because what I think is extraordinary in you on top of all the fantastic things you've done, is really who you are and who you represent. What I see is, is love. I see that in you, in the way that you look at people, in the way that you look at animals. And I think this is your power, and I think this is why people all around the world love you. Yeah, they do, actually. Yeah, <laughs> you know? It's strange. They, do. <laughs> they tell me all the time. Yeah. Do you... So, I, haven't, I haven't tried to behave the way I do. It's just the way I am. And, and why, where do you think it comes from? Do you think it comes from being able to live in nature, to be connected to animals in such a present way? Well, it, partly that, but also the family I grew up in was a very loving family. Hmm. We weren't particularly demonstrative. We didn't hug each other all the time, but we were raised me and my sister, you know, by a loving and supportive mother. And mm. that really makes a difference. I'm trying to understand because yesterday you mentioned we're the most intellectual beings to walk on this earth. Not the smartest, not the most intelligent. You were clear in pointing that out. And you said to solve this crisis that we're in, it needs to come from within. It's not from the head, it's, it's from the heart. Mm. And Probably a mixture of both. I mean, you've good. got to be able to understand, but you've got to feel with your heart. And it seems to me that animals understand that. They respect nature. They understand the importance and the wisdom of nature. But we, the human animals, are disconnected from this. How do we reconnect? And are there exercises, tools, ways that you think people can use to reconnect, to, to nourish that in children and young people. And That's what animals. we do. We try to get children out into nature. Young children, you see the difference. And take a child from the inner city, and at first they're a bit frightened, and then they get fascinated, mm. and then they want to learn more. But so many children have no opportunity to, to get out into nature. Mm. And in the old days, in, when I was first involved in Roots and Shoots, we used to get parents to come and drive little children from the inner city mm. in New York out into one of the parks. But then they weren't allowed to do it because of the insurance and the buses have to be insured so we can't afford it. So we have to try and get nature to them, nature into the classroom. And even if it's just watching a little plant grow and then produce a tomato or something like that. It's, it, it just gives them, you know, some idea. And also um, caterpillar. And there they have to learn, you watch the caterpillar and it grows and it sheds its skin and it grows. And then it makes a chrysalis. But then you have to say, you know, if you don't watch it after about a week, then the butterfly will emerge. And you've got to be there to let the butterfly fly away. Hmm. And so they learn all sorts of things, and they're fascinated. I'm thinking about the story that you shared yesterday. You, you talk about this butterfly flying away. I was moved to tears yesterday when you showed the video of Wunda and her reaction. Yes, I wish people hadn't clapped. It spoils that mm. silence. This, mm. I agree. I could see the, 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 the presence and the beauty. Would you mind sharing the story of Wunda? 
and why it's profound to you and how it makes how it made you feel well wunda arrived in the sanctuary as a tiny infant and her mother had been shot and she was rescued from the illegal wildlife trade the baby was and she was very badly wounded by the bullet that killed her mother but in our sanctuary we have a wonderful veterinarian rebecca tensia she's spanish and she's the executive director of the sanctuary and she's a veterinarian so she managed to uh, save this little baby named Wunda and in the local language that means close to death and so Wunda then joined a group and was doing well and then she got very very sick and I don't think we ever know exactly why she was so sick but she literally was a skeleton and Rebecca performed a chimpanzee blood-to-blood -blood transfusion, which certainly never been done in Africa before, and Wunda recovered. So I had not met Wunda, because I don't visit that sanctuary very often. And when I'm there, I can't meet all the chimps, you know, because now over 100. So the day that Wunda was destined to go onto this big island given to us by the government, um, it was the first time I met her. She was in that traveling cage. And on the boat, I talked to her. Um, she was surrounded by people she knew, but she must have wondered what on earth was happening, you know. The cage put in a car, and then the, the cage put in a boat. And so when she emerged from the cage on the shore of the island, she came out, looked a bit worried, Rebecca, the veterinarian, was calling to her and, and encouraging her with her outstretched hand. And Wunda went over to her and she presented, turned her back to Rebecca, who patted her in reassurance. And then she climbed onto the cage and one of the caregivers stroked her head. And then she looked around in this new place, this beautiful forest. And so she was looking like this and and she sort of did a double take and she turned and she put her arms around me and a chimp embrace is usually something quick but she just went on holding on to me and for the longest time I mean it must have been at least a minute and afterwards one of the caregivers said how did that chimpanzee know that that lady is the one who started it all <laughs> well of course she didn't but I have a a bond with animals very often. And so she must have sensed something. Maybe this love that we were talking about in the beginning. Mm. I do think that this is what people see in you. Well, there was one extraordinary, just to let you know how strange this is. I was giving a talk to a small room full of people in South Africa. And when I arrived, they said, the owner of the house said, well, we know you love dogs and we have two. They are the African hunting dog, they're called the barkless dog, Basenji, they're called a Basenji. And they said, well, it's not that they're dangerous or anything, but they're just not interested in people. Maybe the female will come up and you can pet her, but the male just, just keeps away. So, yeah, the female did come up and I did pet her. And then in this room, which is, well, a little bit wider than this, and the podiums are up at one end. That's got a, they're very rich people, and the carpet, uh, the carpet is white, well, off white, and the same carpet goes up over the podium. So it's like part of the floor. They must have lots of little events there, I think. And um, so when I'm talking, I'm always thinking slightly ahead as to what I'm going to talk about next. Once I'm into my flow on that subject. I'm thinking, oh yes, this guy. So I'm thinking about Rusty, my dog. And at that moment, the male from somewhere at the back walked straight across, right from there, right across the room and climbed up onto this tiny podium that was no bigger than this. And he stood with his side touching my leg and he looked out across the audience. And the owner started to call him. I said, we were told, don't take pictures. But we had our photographer there because he we didn't know and so i caught his eye and i said and we got this picture the dog then lay down 
still facing the audience, still touching me. When I stopped talking about Rusty, he left. That was, that was almost stranger than Wunder. Mm. <laughs> and I'm so glad I've got the picture to prove it. Mm. That interconnection between us human animals mm. and mm. the wild animals. We yeah. think we're not wild animals, but we definitely are. And we have a streak of wildness in us, that's for sure. Jane, Dr. Jane, if we do everything right, how do you picture the world that you want us to hope about, that to, for us to be excited about? What does this world look like? I don't know if it's in 10, 20, or 50 years. And can you be as precise as possible so people can really imagine this and get excited about this, th this world? And you can talk about how we interact in terms of countries, in terms of politics, in terms of national, international interests, in terms of transportation, what we eat, how we connect with animals, however you want, but picturing this image. Well, we have to leave enough years for a large number of our roots and shoots from around the world to become adult, to take up decision-making positions, to be parents, teachers, and so on. And that gives a chance for this understanding that no matter the color of our skin or our nationality or whatever, uh, we're all human beings. So, and Roots and Shoots values include respect, respect for each other, respect to animals, respect for the environment, and compassion. So if this, if this works out, if, and it's all a big if, but let's say we've got a large proportion of young people around the world, now adult, in decision-making positions. That will, that will surely prevent some of the warfare and aggression and brutality that's going on. But then we have to somehow, I don't know, I, I can't really do this because right now, how do we change the terrible, uh, you know, there's a hatred. In Israel, there's a hatred of the Palestinians. In America, the white superior groups, they hate black people, they hate Mexicans, they hate the Chinese, they're white supremists. Uh, the ideal world is when all that hatred and discrimination goes away. Uh, I always loved the chief of a tribe in Latin America who said, Jane, we see our tribe as like an eagle, one wing is male, the other's female, and only when the wings are equal can our tribe fly high. So the ideal world is when male and female play their equally important roles, because we need the feminine characteristics, but we also need the masculine characteristics. We're, you know, two halves of the same coin. And until we alleviate poverty, we'll have people destroying the environment. And until we get respect for animals, we'll have these terrible sports hunters going out and killing beautiful elephants and rhinos and lions to stick heads on their wall and boasting about it. Well, there's no courage. They have a modern rifle. There's a little target in the middle. You aim it at the animal wherever you want and kill it. What's the courage there? None. So these things, you know, there's so many different problems to overcome. So the ideal world is like a dream, but we just have to work towards it. And it's all contingent on how we act now, how fast we can grow roots and shoots, how many countries. I just found somebody today who said, I can help you get it into Palestine. He said, we have a big group working on, which is half Israeli, half Palestinian. I'm sure we can get them to embrace roots and shoots. Mm. So, you know, there's all these problems to overcome this tunnel, but we have to keep our eye on the shining star at the end and work towards it. Mm -hmm. And the groups that are working on the different problems need to work together. Because, I mean, you've got the, to think of, to just say what the ideal world is sounds so idealistic and utopian that it doesn't really make sense. It's just going to get better. But it's nice to have something to look towards, to be able to yes. 
let's look towards that star mm. and work towards it as hard as we can yes. and grow roots and shoots and think about our own environmental footprint and how we treat people and animals. You mentioned everybody makes an impact every day, it depends what type of impact. Someone listening to this may be a bit hopeless, looking around the world and wondering, what can I do? What would you tell them? So what I tell them is stop looking all around the world because if you look around the world, if I look around the world, I'm depressed. You cannot look at what's happening around the world and not be depressed. You know, look at Ukraine, look at America, look at Trump, look at all these African fightings, look at the torture of animals and on and on and on. So don't look around the world, but think of something you can do in your community or your line of business and tackle it. Just go in there and get a group to pick up trash, get a group to raise money for refugees, uh, go and volunteer with your friends in an in a animal shelter or save up food to go in a food bank. You know, every, just do something. And if you do something, you'll feel a whole lot better because you see, well, gosh, I did make a difference. And then you think around the world as other people also making a difference. And so then you dare think globally, helping to raise awareness, helping to fight ignorance, helping to alleviate poverty, thinking about your own environmental footstep and encouraging others to do the same. Children are changing their parents all the time. And so we just have to take it bit by bit by bit and not be impatient. Even though we want it to happen tomorrow, it won't. We have to be realistic. We've just got to work towards that ideal. And only by getting the children gathered around the world, we're hoping you know, to get more and more funding to bring young people together, to bring our roots and shoots together. At the moment, it's mostly virtual. Mm -hmm. But we have a program called Partners in Understanding. And we've now got some big corporations and the staff adjoining roots and shoots. And then they're in, in their different offices around the world. The children of those staff are being linked together so that they learn about different cultures. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. I, I'm always wanting to call you Jane. Doctor. Do call me Jane. Thank you. I like to be called Jane. <laughs> Lovely. Thank you. I'll call mm. you Jane. Mm. Jane, I'm very respectful of your time, of course. Is there anything else you would share? <clears throat> anything that you know, maybe you would like to add, or do you think this no, is... No, just remember that you make a difference every day, you yourself, and help us to spread the word and see if you can help us with roots and shoots or whatever. Thank you. You definitely make a difference every day. Yeah, well, you make a difference of some sort. It That's depends. Right. <laughs> I mean, if you don't think about it, you might, you might do something damaging without thinking about it. Mm -hmm like choosing what to buy and not buying it if it's made unethically or it's cheap because other people are being starved because their wages are unfair. So you, you make a difference it's for the good or for the bad or it's just nothing. But you can't live through a day. One little boy said, oh, well, I can make a difference. I can live through the day without making any difference. I said, can you? What will you do? <laughs> I'll stay in bed. And I said, OK, you can stay in bed. Um, will, you, will you not breathe? Because when you breathe, you're taking in oxygen and you're giving out CO2, so you're making a difference. I said, oh, I see. <laughs> and I said, um, will you not go to the toilet? Because if you go to the toilet and you flush it, that's making a difference. And are you not going to eat all day? If you eat, that's going to make a difference. By the end, he said, I see what you mean. <laughs> <laughs> so, little examples like that. And there was a lot of last story, a little boy in Burundi. You can tell stories all day if you want. No, I d I've, got to, I've got to recover for this evening. <laughs> uh, he was seven years old. And after he came to my talk, and he was one of these little African boys dressed in a suit. They looked so cute when they're seven. 
and he looked up at me, it was a reception, he was tiny and all these other big Burundians, you know, looked up at me with these big eyes that African children have. And he said, um, he said, if I pick up a piece of trash every day, I'll make a difference. And I said, yes, you will. And I said, supposing you persuade 10 of your friends to pick up a piece of trash every day. He said, oh, we'd really make a difference. And I said, and yes, now imagine each of your 10 friends persuade each of their 10 friends. He said, we'll, we'll really start clearing up all the trash, won't we? <laughs> you know, it was very sweet. <laughs> He's also the little boy with his same big eyes who said, your name says it all. You're all good. All good. <laughs> little boy, little kid. Yeah, you can see it too. Hope. Hope. The light at the end of the tunnel yeah, can is. come. Yes. That's one of the Jane magic things. <laughs> <laughs> it's something called Jane magic. Coming from you or is it? I don't know. It's Jane magic. I can feel it. Mm? Three times I've stopped the rain. I'm serious. Three times. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can feel it. Yeah. I can feel it just in your presence, really. Well, I don't it's know. Enjoyable. It's all a mystery to me, but... <laughs> okay, well... Thank you. Thank you, Jane. You're more than welcome. Yeah, thank you so much for your presence, for your time, for your stories. It's really a privilege. Really. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I will continue spreading the, the star, the light. Now I have to go and inspire people again to do <laughs> it. <laughs> yeah, you have this work to do inspire everybody all the time that must be it's very hard work <laughs> <laughs> okay that's a wrap 20 minutes with dr jane goodall in this episode i only had the time to play a bit with jane and ask only a few questions of course there is so much more to explore if you want to go deeper i recommend her documentary jane it's a great way to dive into her life and work you can also read her latest book the Book of Hope, a survival guide for an endangered planet. If you want to support Jane's hard work, you can donate to the Jane Goodall Institute. Your donation will help protect endangered chimpanzees, restore critical habitats, improve human well-being, and empower the next generation of changemakers through roots and shoots. You can also support the Jane Goodall Institute by launching an Atlas Go challenge in your company. Atlas Go is an app I co-founded that help organizations around the world support the well-being of their people while making a positive impact. With Atlas Go, you keep your people happy as they track all sorts of healthy activities and connect with one another wherever they are in the world. We have more than hundreds of activities, physical well-being like running or biking, but also mental well-being like meditation or yoga. We also added sustainability activities like recycling or cooking a vegetarian meal, so your people can start healthy habits that support our planet. And the best part of this is that your activities convert into trees planted by the Jane Goodall Institute. So when you do five kilometers of walking, you will plant a tree and contribute to your well-being and the well-being of our planet. If you launch an Atlas Go challenge in your company before the end of 2023, I will donate 1,000 trees in your name to the Jane Goodall Institute. So join companies like Decathlon, Paramount, Swiss Re, Belron, Nestle, and many more who trust us with the well-being of their people. Go to atlasgo.org slash Jane to find more information about this impactful offer. Before we close, I'd like to share a little anecdote to add some flavor to Jane and her extraordinary personality. After a long day of interviews and speeches and inspiring everybody, you would imagine that Jane would be going to sleep early. But after her last picture with an inspired fan, she retreats to her room for an after party. Jane stayed up until 1 a.m., poured herself a glass of whiskey, and shared funny stories about her life. She told me about her friendship with Leonardo DiCaprio and about Picasso, a pig whose paintings sell for thousands of dollars. The next day, she is up early, preparing for her next adventure. I asked her why she continues to do it, to travel around the world and work so hard. She simply said, because it makes a difference. One of my favorite quotes from Jane is this one. 
Everything you do makes a difference, and you have to decide what kind of difference you want to make. So I ask you, what difference will you make? As you ponder on this question, don't forget to connect with nature. It's beautiful, and you are part of it. Thank you for your attention today. Love, Tommy.